So just going back to the, the, the effect of the prodigy on Excel, oh, yeah, because yeah. you know we talked about the lessons you learned, but we all just really trying to get to the bottom of you've got this nice little label that was released in you know singles and, and, and it came out of a scene, but then all of a sudden this this one of your artists goes into Stella. Um, what does it do to the team of people and what does it do to you and what does it do to the label? Mm. Well, that, there was definitely a, I mean, the, the rule of thumb with independent labels who have an act that goes really massive, which is what everyone wanted, is it kills the label. That just has a tendency to happen, like, you know, creation after Oasis and things have a tendency to sort of fall apart. And although it doesn't appear that that happened with Excel, it sort of did happen with Excel because it was a kind of mark one of Excel. And it was like a sort of thing, there's sort of been two distinct halves to it, and that was, that was like the end of, of the first half, really. Um, and nothing much really happened for, from like when the Prodigy became really successful to, to the end of that decade, really. You know, so like 97 to the end of the decade. You know, looking back on it, how, you know, creatively our output was quite weak. Like, it, it wasn't a particularly good label in that time. And I think there was a, a certain confusion sets in when like an artist has gone that big because there's a sort of, a, some of the stuff that I think you, you take real like delight in and pride in like suddenly becomes a bit mundane because you've kind of seen a bit too much. So I think that, that, that's, that was a phase that we kind of like wrestled with what to do. Yeah. Not particularly realising that at the time but you know there wasn't we just weren't finding what was exciting at that time I don't we were, were, were sort of plugged into it but we we're working you know we we're working with Prodigy and doing that and, and trying to do other things but like, I look back on those things and they weren't I don't think we were particularly connected to, to anything that interesting and um, it wasn't that I don't know that was it wasn't a great period and coming into like um, 2000 and 2001 um, it was really you know basement jacks who, who musically weren't you know, a million miles from, from Prodigy and it was still dance based. But they were definitely a fresh sort of breath of fresh air as individuals and they were like they were, you know, a couple of people who had like again really good focus on what they were doing, coming out of Brixton with their own club and sort of sort of had an idea of something they could do and do it well and they did. And um very shortly after Basement Jacks I started working with Badly Drawn Boy, who um was a big sort of the big development for the label and that you know he I mean, there was a kind of, there was a link to sort of subculture and he had a label of his own called Twisted Nerve in Manchester um, and with a producer called Andy Votel and there was some sort of like, Andy was quite hip-hop influenced and there, you know, there, there were links there. Um, you know, it all fe it felt connected to me but at the same time, I think he was a, he was what was perceived as an indie artist or an alternative artist. So although I, I wasn't feeling like there was any huge leap, I think the way it came out was Okay, this is like a label that was a dance label that's now doing something else. And it's funny with these things because you, you don't feel that and then people start commenting on it and you're thinking, well, that's not relevant. But actually it ends up making a big difference because it's not just what you do, it's how people perceive what you do. So people's perception of that was, well, musically, it's not just about dance music and it's broader than that. That was very useful because that then kind of opened, that opened things up to what we did after that. Yeah. And then was it White Stripes, which was a big one after that? Yeah. And that and and that was, I suppose, the first uh, time that you signed an American artist. Was it that right? Yeah. yeah I mean, there've been there've, there've been quite a few things we did with with US. Like we used to work with American labels, like going over there and licensing records. Right. And also there was a a, a rap act called House of Pain, whose albums we put out in the early nineties as well, which was that was that was that was good. That that worked well. Um, but um, yeah, the white, so the, the White Stripes was, you know, they put out a couple of records already in sympathy for the record industry, which was a label based in Detroit. And I suppose we were, we were just far enough out of being perceived as solely a dance label that I was able to sort of talk to, to Jack about the idea of us doing his records in a way that he was you know, he was into the kind of, I think saw it as like a bit unlikely. Well, do you think that, that, that perhaps the fact that you were pre previously and maybe still a, an element of a dance label and therefore, you know, cutting edge attracted him and that there was a danger that, you know, he, he's playing what essentially is guitar rock music 
a different take on it, that he doesn't want to go and sign to a guitar rock type label. Yeah, and I think I think that is possible. And also, I think they probably, from from what from, I think I, from what he saw of it, like the scene we, you know, the scene we came out, you know, they came out of the scene as well. The White Stripes came out of a scene in Detroit, which was which they were kind of looking to get out of, really, because those scenes they they were great in that scene. But there's a point where you need to go on to something else, and that was the point for them. So, you know, I think that experience of being in a scene and, a, and about that audience, but then kind of trying to trying to like. It's, Trying to expand, but without losing what you've got in the first place. That's the, that was the sort of the challenge. And how do, and and so how do you find working with an artist like White Stripes, who were not a dance act, not a rave act, were not were American. Um, so there were the geographical problems possibly as well. I mean, was, did that bring a whole different set of different challenges? Well, they, they became successful first here. So in a lot of ways, they didn't they didn't feel remote. You know, and they and they came over a lot, and um, yeah, it was just a just a tremendous learning experience, and continues to be that because he, I mean, <coughs> I think Jack White's very very unusual. That you don't you don't need to be as good at as many things as he is in order to do well in music. It's a very rare level of like natural talent and craft in terms of being a guitarist and a writer and a singer. And a producer and an engineer, you know, he can, you know, he can, he can actually like make a guitar better than most people can play a guitar. So it's a very unusual level of of a comp, you know, a, a accomplishment that he's got, which you know, someone you know, someone like Prince has got, and it's very very unusual, I think. So someone like that, I think, is just that's that's always for for me, that's always a pleasure. You know, you meet anyone like that, you work with someone like that, you're going to learn a huge amount from it if you're open to it. Um, and uh, so no, it, it, I mean it always, always did and continues to feel like just, um, just quite. And you know we're there to like just, you know the, the labour is there to sort of facilitate someone like that. Mm. There's, I mean there's very few people like you that. You just don't want to get in their way.